Okay, we are going to be going through the S&P 500 chart storm here. And so for those who aren't aware of this report or little series of charts, it's what I do on my personal account over on Twitter. And it's pretty much just 10 different charts on the S&P 500. And I try to get uh, charts that feature quite a few different things, um, be it technicals, breadth, or, you know, things like volatility, sentiment, fundamentals, um, you know, sometimes the, the fundamentals don't get that much attention, but you know, definitely include those. And anything else, like, you know, in this edition, there's going to be one on value and versus growth. And any other really sort of interesting charts that um, help provo provoke a little bit of thought and get a bit of discussion going. So what we're doing here is looking at it in the uh, Twitter moments view. And what that allows us to do is to look for the charts in a fairly clean fashion. So number one, max drawdown year to date for the S&P 500. It's the second lowest on record. And I put the question there, does that bother you? And um, yeah, it's quite an interesting table, really. You know, what this is is sort of year, year to date maximum drawdowns um, put together by Charlie Bellello, really good uh, chart master there. Um, and if you look at this, there's, there's actually quite a few periods there where you do get fairly low drawdowns, um, max drawdowns for the year. You know, quite you know, a string of minus fives around there. Um, and it's only really during really wild market gyrations, um, you know, during the war period there, um, during the dot-com crash over there, and, um, you know, the 2007, uh, 2008 crisis, really. You know, it's, it's more bear markets that you tend to get um, more significant drawdowns. Even in the um, market turmoil of 2015-2016, it was in the order of um, 12-10% there. So it's, um, you know, I guess the point of that one, or um, the question that one will raise is, is that the worst it's going to get to, or are we going to see worse than that? And on a kind of related note, volatility. Um, this chart here from Goldman Sachs was shared by this user here, Ad Adnan Chian. Um, very interesting sort of view there. Um, takes it all the way back to 1928. You've got um, a number of spikes here and a bit of annotation about them, um, really just putting it in context. Um, and then one of my own. So this is implied volatility, and it's been standardized so that we can you know, give it a um, common view. Because if you look at if you look at bonds, currencies, commodities, or even equity volatility in the VIX there, they all trade at quite different levels. Um, and that reflects that you, know, you, you generally see different um, magnitudes of price changes across them. So commodities and equities, um, you know, they, they have generally higher volatility. And bonds and currencies to have generally lower implied volatility. But anyway, um, when you standardize it, so taking a z-score, um, you can see that, yes, the VIX and the sort of dark grey line there is low, but then so is cross asset volatility. That's just the average of bonds, currencies, commodities. Um, and, you know, it's, it's um, we had that really low point in volatility around 2014, which kind of marked the point where the regime sort of started to change, like the surge in the US dollar really took off at about this point. Um, so, you know, it, it can be really meaningful to, to pay attention when you do get particularly pronounced um, drops in volatility because it can oftentimes signal a change in regime. This particular chart was in the latest um, weekly report, so in touch if you want to have a look at what I talked about there. And um, the same one from the same report. Um, this is VIX speculative futures positioning and uh, that, that there is on the uh, left hand axis. I forgot to label it. Um, that's net speculative futures positioning standardized against uh, open interest. And what you've got there is uh, it's really stretched to the downside. And, you know, it's a classic nickels in front of a steamroller trade, shorting the VIX. 
um, you get pretty pretty decent returns from the futures role by it being short um, and you know it's it's yeah you can get a pretty decent yield from that but then the moment you get one of these little spike things happening it kind of um, can wipe out the strategy if not ruin it or at least give it a very big drawdown which will take some time to recover from we got the start to get there um, that gives you an example of um, a short VIX strategy of how that looks but anyway when it stretched to the downside um, you can see there quite a few times um, that when it gets that fast stretched to the, the downside it can be a, um, a bit of a bottom or a um, turning point on to uh, number five from sentiment trader if you haven't heard of sentiment trader you definitely want to check him out so he's produces some very good stuff um, used to be a subscriber to his service and it's um, very very worthwhile so you should definitely look into that and his chart here has got Rydex bull versus bear assets or flows here I'm not sure what exactly it is but anyway the point is um, it's as high it is, as it was until back then and um, while that one didn't really provide a massive signal of a big correction or anything like that there was perhaps a little bit of a downturn after you got that little tiny sell off there um, like many of these kind of indicators sentiment indicators when you get a spike up and a pull down from an extreme it can often um, be a bit of a presage to something happening and, and you know, when you saw this here it's sort of just a little bit of um, various divergence you can see that um, that, that indicator is uh, gradually trending down versus price just going minding its own business before you get that bit of um, correction period there so um, you know, perhaps it's not so much the level that it is here but what happens next to it so that one will be one to keep on the radar another one of my ones using State Street's uh, Investor Confidence Index now this index is not one of those you know do you feel bullish or bearish ones it's um, there State Street is a custodian business so if you think about large fund managers um, they generally will have all their um, assets that are held by State Street on behalf of their clients and um, you know so basically State Street will oversee or um, administer you know, I think probably a trillion or so of funds um, probably even possibly even more than that but a substantial portion of um, institutional money um, it's, it's State Street and there's a couple of others um, BNP, BNY um, that are in that business anyway when you're in that business you you you've got all sorts of um, data there and what they've done is used um, the data you know at a high level of um, what their clients are doing and um, when allocations to equities are going up um, it's above that 100 point line and when it's going down it's below that 100 point line so it measures institutional investor confidence by looking at what they're doing and as you can see here um, I guess in institutional investors I've put the comment here are reluctant and skeptical bulls so yes they're on the buying side on the increasing allocation side but not um, not very not very eagerly so you know as um, the momentum's fairly strong that um, you know stands on contrast to that period there and I guess you know it's fairly um, easy to understand why there's a lot of things going on at the moment um, valuations are pretty high the Fed's hiking rates a lot of latent risks that are hiding around out there especially on the geopolitical front so yeah it probably makes sense um, I guess the other thing is that you know they're not throwing caution to the wind um, which would be one signal you know when they're getting extremely bullish there uh, just before the <laughs> little period of angst that occurred um, and they're not, you know, potentially sounding the warning signs um, by running for the exits. On to number seven. Now, I did actually think that that was um, the financial stress index, which kind of looks quite similar, but it's actually the VIX turned upside down. And it's a pretty good reminder that, you know, 
you know, if you think of VIX as a measure of financial stress, um, it's certainly one element. Um, you know, <laughs> you kind of want to embrace the stress. Um, you know, when you get these big spikes there, it's oftentimes um, a marker of the time to be not panicking. Now, number eight, I put here in quotes, um, the market is just driven by QE and central ma bank manipulation. Um, and uh, yeah, that is sarcasm. So what we've got here is the employment trend index um, and the S&P 500. This is from Estiana George Laracon. I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, anyway, it's a good chat from George there. Um, got the unemployment or the employment trend going up um, and pretty much what this says is that um, stocks are going up because you know the fundamentals are getting better um, now are they going up faster than the fundamentals well because value valuations are going up then yes a little bit but the point is um, you know if, if if employment was just going sideways and the price is going up, then yeah, that kind of statement might actually um, be accurate. But you know, it's 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 just um, it's lazy analysis to try and say something like that. It's um, you know you you're quitting before you even um, give it a go if you're um, if you're if you're if you're just throwing your hands up and um, you know buying into that whole um, meme of negativity and um, you know. I think that's probably enough to be said about that one. Anyway, and on to the next one. Value versus growth. This is the index or ratio of value versus growth. When it goes down, that means that growth is beating value. When it goes up, value is beating growth. So we had this big spike up here. Why? Because the majority of value stocks are actually um, financials. Um, you know, and that's pretty easy to understand because financials are trading at pretty low valuations. One of the reasons because of that is because we've seen you know, fairly flat yield curve, fairly low bond yields, um, and also a tougher regulatory environment. So banks have actually struggled on the profitability, so um, hence having lower valuations. So if you see a turnaround in their profitability, for example, when you had that big run up in bond yields there, then that's going to change the game for financials. Same thing for commodities. Been a lot of um, commodity companies that have been bet down because of um, the commodity crash or the commodity bear market, and um, you know if you have a surge in commodities and interest rates or you know certainly bond yields, then that's going to be supportive of value overgrowth, um, and you know I'd, I would say that that's probably a fair um, fair base case to have. Um, my base case on a sort of medium tactical view is the bond yields go higher from here um, so yeah maybe it is the bottom it's at the bottom of the end, end of the range so it's one to keep an eye on and then final one is the mystery fund so we've got the mystery fund this this chart written here it's from a GMO report um, GMO produced some really interesting research actually um, so you should definitely check it out um, if, I think it's on their website, you go to the website, GMO, um, and there's a white paper, white paper section, they've got some pretty interesting stuff there. Um, they're generally at the pessimistic end of the scale, but um, that's, um, that's probably a product of um, being quite value focused. Um, you know, they've got a pretty pretty smart framework, I think, for um, the expected return models, and um, you know, when you look at the outputs of the expected returns. Um, you can probably understand why they'd have a pessimistic bias. Anyway, mystery fund, um, pretty interesting performance against the S&P 500. I'm not going to actually tell you what the mystery fund is. I'll leave you to guess. You can put that in the comments, and um, you know, if you if you get it, I'll I'll tell you. <laughs> so right, I'll probably leave it at that. Um, any feedback or questions or comments? Or requests for next time let me know otherwise subscribe to the channel and I will put another one of these up next week and also be putting up a video later in the week um, just to talk through one of the topics of the latest weekly report